Hey everybody, welcome to Loose Cast. I'm your host Matt. I'm Drew. And I'm Tyler. Welcome to the Linux Cast. We are back. We did take a week off last week because we were all busy. And uh, it, it is uh, good to be back with you gentlemen. Uh, we're going to talk about some good old fashioned Google tonight. So that should draw some people in because Never everyone... Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody did make a, po- uh, a point in the chat earlier how we're going to be talking about de-googling yourself on youtube <laughs> so it's a little there's a little irony there but we're, we're going to talk about de-googling yourself um such as it is but anyways that's the main topic but before we jump into that we're going to go around the horn as we usually do and talk about what we've done over the course of the last couple of weeks that's interesting uh in technology foss linux whatever so drew take us away i'm not sure what it is about august or september but i get lazy like real freaking lazy and i i did put a video out the one that i mentioned three weeks ago finally but i have been again i've been working quite a bit like job stuff most people know that i put a video uh, sorry uh, uh i made a script and and a video that went with that script about a month ago and it took a month to craft that script from scratch essentially installing nine x11 window managers and i wanted to have the same type of script for wayland so that is what i put out today i put out a script for wayland but the only thing that it installs right now currently is sway and it allows you to install a customized sway and uh and that is really the only thing i have been doing in the last couple weeks um so there you go. Hi- Hyperland soon to follow on, on your, your script? Well, you know, I did Hyperland on Debian testing a few a few months ago, had to pin it to uh, version 0.36. Uh, however, I'm glad that it actually is in the Debian testing or experimental. One of them, it's in the repo. So hopefully it will be a package that will be available when Debian Trixie comes out in the summer of 2025. Cool. All right, Tyler, what about you? What you been up to? Well, other than just playing VR way too much, I got the M1 Mac support all working on the laptop for Nix OS. I've been, or for Zany OS in Nix OS. So like that Apple M1 support is included out of the box. My setup is already working. I'm running it on my M1, my sister's M1 MacBook Air. I went ahead and bought that just so I could actually build out support for it and use it. And the other MacBook, I mean, as soon as M3 support is actually a real thing, I'll be using it on here too because it's regular old Nix OS. I'm happy with it. I like it. It's just, it, it is a little different in the sense like I can't use Discord and Spotify and Steam. Those are the only three apps that I can't use that were part of my regular workflow, but those have been easily fixed and solved. Like just use WebCord instead. That has an ARM build, works just fine. Spotify, you can use in the browser, like who cares? And Steam games, 99.9% of them wouldn't even run on it anyway. So no point. So it's been really nice. I mean, Hyperland, every aspect of Zany OS works just fine under it i can close the lid and the laptop last for i mean it's not the same as mac os but i mean still lasts for a really long time so it's great nice that's pretty much what i've been up to finally put some software on that hardware that makes sense Uh (laughs) uh uh-huh yeah yeah. oh and and also the funny thing is is the wallpaper the default wallpaper that i use in zany os by default for the theme and everything Oddly matches the rose gold that my sister's MacBook M1 has on the top. Really, like it blends into the actual MacBook. Looks really cool. Okay, so I've been having an existential crisis. <laughs> so you guys know I bought that Windows box so I could use DaVinci Resolve, and I made a whole video about it, and it was full of just teen angst all over the place. It was like just Matt spewing angst all over. And it wasn't pretty at all. Uh, and, I, you know, I had a lot of comments like, oh, why didn't you just put, you know, why didn't you just do this, 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 this? And, and I had responses to all those things. But 
I, I, I was resolved to stick with Windows because I really wanted to use DaVinci Resolve, and I couldn't, cannot get it to work on this PC with the hardware that I currently have. And, and you know, it was going to be fine. So my initial setup had a KVM switch, which allowed me to use one of my monitors to switch back and forth between the two computers. And it worked fine, but what I really wanted was if I was going to stick with this, I wanted to be able to use all three of my monitors uh, with both my Linux box and the Windows box. So I went out and purchased a KVM switch, uh, stupidly, that allows you to use three monitors hooked up to two different computers. Now, it is a good idea in theory, but if you think about it, that means there's three display cords coming out of the monitors, there's six going to the two computers, so that's nine cables plus the three USB cables. It was a cable nightmare. And it took me about two hours to set up. And I got it all set up, all the cables as arranged as possible with that mess. And it didn't work. <laughs> and it didn't work. Now, I know why it didn't work. Because I was short one cable. And if you're short one display cable, that display won't work. That's, that's what was happening. So I ripped it all out and said, screw this. I'm done. That was that. That was the breaking point. It wasn't that Windows was terrible, which it is. It was that I just did not want to set that up again. So I decided originally what I was going to do is get a laptop, like a high-end laptop with an in a video card, so I could run Nvidia with run Resolve on that. Um, because you know, I'm kind of in need of a new laptop anyways. One behind me is really kind of crappy, but. It turns out if you want a high-end laptop, it's really fucking expensive. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, like, like the last time like, I haven't bought a brand new laptop probably in ten years. I always buy used. Like the, the one from behind is like in 2013 or whatever, and and before that I had a, like a really old 2011 Lenovo. I always buy used, but I was gonna buy used buy new this time, and I looked at it and was like. No, <laughs> I'm not going to spend that much money on a laptop. I just, I have no interest in it. So what I did instead was spend half the much, much money on an NVIDIA 4070 Ti Super. I'm going to put that in my main Linux box, see how it works, and hopefully that solves everything. And then I can use, just use Resolve on Linux like a proper nerd, hopefully. I don't know whether or not it's going to work or not. I hope it does. I, I'm, I'm a little worried because I have... So, I've simplified my monitor setup a little bit today because I switched the LG dual up from dual display mode just to using one single like huge ass display. So I'm hoping that that helps a little bit and it'll actually work with Wayland. We'll see how it goes. I'm a little nervous because you hear horror stories about how Nvidia works with Wayland. I don't. I don't know. I haven't used an Nvidia card probably in almost as long as I've you know the whole laptop thing. So. That's what the main thing I've been doing uh, is fighting with that. But also, I bought myself a new keyboard. <laughs> so <laughs> sick. <laughs> I, well, granted, I I did this ages ago. So I might have even already said this, but I got myself a dactyl manual form, and it is fucking awesome. It is so good. It's also weird. <laughs> Like, it is so weird. I, I So it's a split keyboard. It, it's very curved, kind of like a Kinesis Vantage Pro or whatever it's called. And it works really, really well. I did switch out the browns that came with it and put in uh, blues so that the, there was a little bit more actuation force. And I'm can, you, up to, can you show it off on camera? I probably can. I know some people won't be able to see it because they're just listening to the audio, but... I, I'm sure I'm I plugging think, my... I'm, I think you did show me a picture of I'm it, and sure it does I'm look wild. I'm plugging my keyboard during the stream is going to be perfectly fine but this is what half of it looks like anyways so everybody can see this on both cameras um, totally regular keyboard yes bog standard i'm, I'm sure i'm <laughs> sure my keyboard's gonna work now uh, <laughs> and anyways yeah so i got that it was um not a necessary purchase <laughs> i i have a keyboard addiction i can't help it it's it's absolutely the the truth <laughs> you, you posted that on mastodon or something didn't you I yeah, I po yeah, I yeah, yeah. i've posted pictures of all of it because i'm very very proud of it I, I i call this the final destination of my keyboard like this is going to be the one that i stick with for a while but we all know that's not true <laughs> like there, there will be there there will be some lusting after key uh, some keyboard and i go like, oh, i have to have it 
it's stupid. I can't help it. It's 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 a dumb and very expensive habit to ha- uh, like hobby to have. So if you guys out there are thinking, well, you know, a mechanical keyboard sounds like a really good ha- hobby to have. Don't do it. It's really fucking expensive and it's pointless because you can only use one keyboard at a time per computer. Okay. You can't use more than, I mean, technically, I suppose you could use more, but what would be the the point? (laughs) A whole bunch of macro keys? I don't know. All right. (laughs) Anyways, that's my weekend. It didn't really have anything to do that much with Linux, but that's okay. Anyways, I hope that was entertaining for you guys as much as it was for me. So we're going to jump into the main topic, which this week is what we're going to talk about. Is it possible to completely rid yourself of Google, like from top to bottom, rid yourself of a Google account? Can you do that? Now, uh, there's some obvious provisos here for the three of us. Because for the three of us, it's really not possible, right? Because all three of us have a YouTube account, and we can't get rid of that unless we, you know, stop doing YouTube. Like, that's that's the bare minimum we have to have, right? So for the answer for us three, at least, is no. But let's pretend the three of us are normal people and not YouTubers, you know, and we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're just normies. Tyler, as hard as this is going to be for you, you pretend yourself as an normal person. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, such an asshole. Uh, anyways. You so, may have a point. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that point of view. Do you guys, we'll just start off with the, the main question. Do you think it's possible to completely rid yourself of Google in this day and age? Tyler, you want to go first? Sure. Probably not unless you're like, Amish or like maybe Mennonite, you know, (laughs) like genuinely speaking, because I mean, all right, let's say you want, you want to like completely de-Googleify everything, but like you want to go get a job at Walmart. They're going to give you a questionnaire of bull crap. You got to fill out during the job stuff that you probably would like to use Google to complete like you know, there's a lot of jobs that give you the questionnaires and stuff. And there's a lot of people that use Google just to instantly solve that. I mean, if you don't want to do that, let's say you get a job being a handyman. Like at some point you're, you're going to need YouTube. Like you're going to, you're going to encounter something that you don't know how to do. You need to get done and YouTube's the place to go for it. I mean, you could do, you could use soft alternatives for Google, but a lot of those at the end of the day use Google. True. So even as a user, you're talking about, you know, you know, even if we did not have YouTube channels that we like <laughs> upload our videos to, we would still use YouTube for watching other people <laughs> with their channels, you know? Uh, it's just it just seems like Google has become so interwoven into our into everything, which is the problem basically, because they are way, way too intrusive into our lives. And yeah, we can give it a shot for trying to remove as much Google from our lives, but man, I don't know that it's, I mean, it could be possible, but I I just don't see it. I just don't see how, I mean, we, we can come up with like alternatives for just about everything. However, there's always that element that we're going to have to go back to. And that could be, and like, I, I think you're on the money when it comes to YouTube. I just think that there is no alternative. There's just no alternative to YouTube. There's just, you know, you could find alternatives in just about every other way with email or privacy focused search engines or uh, browsers or cloud storage or even maps and navigation or calendars and contacts and operating there's i mean it's there are alternatives for all those things but it's hard it is really stinking hard and also a lot of those services are not scalable like you can't scale them the same way youtube or you know gmail scales it just it doesn't do that if you want to start a company and use I don't know, some alternative to Gmail that's, you know, a small startup self-hosted. Scaling that to an enterprise scale is probably not affordable. Like, it's just not an option as as a company. Also, too, I feel like, because I I saw it brought up in chat, like, you can use uh, Google services without signing in. 
just so it's clear, I, as far as I was aware, that this entire conversation is not using Google, period. Not just not not having a Google account. That's, I mean, sure, you can use Google services anonymously to some extent, but I don't think that's the point. Also, I don't know if using services that rely on Google are a good example of getting away from Google. Because at the end of the day, you're just obfuscating your usage of Google, not not using it. Well, we'll talk more about the whole possibilities for obfuscation here in a couple minutes. Because I think that that I think especially with you, especially because Drew was right. Like it's, like there's there's alternatives for everything. And yes, yeah, scaling for like enterprise level would be hard. But from a personal level, if you want to use alternatives for Gmail, those things are out there. If you want to turn it to Google Doc. Google Docs, Google Photos, whatever, all that stuff's out there. And none of it's actually really all that hard or even cost prohibitive if you want to get into that stuff. I mean, you can do it fairly cheaply to do so. But the one area where there's not a good alternative really is YouTube. Yes, PureTube does exist. Yes, Odyssey does exist. But they're not equivalent. Like, they're just, they're just absolutely not. Like, they try and it's, ad it's admirable for them to do what they can. But... Like, for example, I have a PeerTube instance that I contribute to. It's, it's, done, it's done by somebody else, and, you know, you know, I give them some money on Patreon or whatever, but that's basically my level of, of interaction with it. And I only get, like, 23 gigabytes of storage on that instance. And that means that when that storage is gone, I have to go in through and delete all the ones that are there so that the rest of my syncing actually works. Plus, YouTube breaks, breaks the syncing all the time. Like, like right now, TIL vids is basically broken in terms of the synchronization because it's just not working because YouTube broke it. Like, so, um, because the, they just don't have the content available and they don't have the, 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 the messaging that would allow them to become big enough or the, the, the resources because storage and bandwidth for this kind of stuff is just absolutely astronomical. So like Tyler said, it's not scalable, and that's not an, an enterprise problem. That's like an everyone problem because if everyone goes there to watch Mr. Beast or or um, you know whatever you, you know or watch the the live stream of the U.S. men's basketball team, it's going to break things because nobody nobody but Google and Microsoft and very few companies have the the resources available to stream that kind of thing to any number of people. So. YouTube is the thing, and so we'll talk more about, you know, obfuscation here in a minute. But I think that one of the things that I think is important that we should talk about a little bit is, like, I, I think that the reasons why you'd want to de-Google yourself are pretty obvious. You know, p privacy, maybe you're anti-capitalistic, you know, whatever. And there's just tons of reasons why you'd want to do so. I, I also think that because of those reasons that more and more people are probably going to be slowly it's, it's going to be kind of like the transition over to a lot of more people using linux it's it's not going to happen all at once like everybody's going to flee google but i do think that over time more and more people are interested in doing this and they find out what we're talking about is i guess it's kind of possible but it requires a lot of work and there are some big exceptions to it you know that you kind of have to pay attention to then you get into the obfuscation, obfuscation stuff that we'll talk about here in a few minutes right so the process of doing so requires so much effort that it, it's not uh, that it might as well not be possible right because because it does requ it does require you to put quite a bit of effort in like if you're going to if you're going to if you want to get away from google photos there are some professional and commercial things that you can go to if you don't want to self-host. Those things exist, but none of them are as built into your life as Google Photos is. Because, like, if you have an Android phone, Google Photos is just there. It works. They give you, like, 100 gigabytes for free. You know what I mean? It, you know, if, if you buy, like, a Samsung phone, you get, like, two terabytes or whatever it is for free for, for a couple of years or whatever. You know, and... Uh, same thing with like the the one other than like YouTube, the one thing that I find myself using the most is Google Assistant. When I, when I'm on Android, is the Google Assistant thing. Like it's 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 handy, right? Like I can be in the shower, I can shout at it to skip to the next song because I don't want to hear the song that it's on, right? You know, and that's handy. Like it's not it's something that is very something that is very useful, and I think that that's the one thing that Google does really well sometimes not always but sometimes is is they give you products that are 
very, very useful for you. And once they get you in there, I mean, once you start start using Google for, or Gmail for like 10 years or whatever, it's really hard to take that thing and go somewhere else. Like, yeah, there's a ton of alternatives. You can go to Tutanota, ProtonMail, Zoho, uh, Microsoft if you wanted to go to, to Microsoft, whatever. You, there are tons of them. But once you have all your stuff there, it's really hard to take that stuff and just, you know, I'm from Cyanar, I'm going away. So it's kind of a bait and switch thing, too, because I remember when, like, if you had a domain name back in the day, they would give you, like, you know, Google Workspaces for free. You know, you could move all your stuff, like any personal website that you had, you could use, I don't know, let's just say, you know, uh, the linuxcast.org and have that back in two was it 2010 or 11 or something like that it was free you could just like change your mx dns to google and then you would have email for free and that was <laughs> but it, it's the same thing where why we are in the state that we are in they gave away everything for free in the beginning you know here's the best search engine in the world that was free you know here's a gmail that is free and all of this stuff now what we give up is they are in our lives like in a significant way now everything that we either have is theirs you know what we have as far as pictures and files and anything that will is there can be used by them for AI purposes or what have you. It's that is why I decided about a year ago that, like you were just describing, Matt, you get locked in for a decade. That's what I mean. That's that was where I was. I've been locked in for an absolute decade plus of just using Google stuff. You know why? Because it's freaking easy to just have everything work together. But what you give up, I just thought, you know what? It's not worth it. Not even close is it worth it any longer. Yeah. One thing is is that, you know, so I've kind of made the same, I, I have tried many times over the years to say, I'm gonna use Google less. A and it always comes down to how much am, am I willing to put up with inferior services? Because in, in a lot of ways, the services that are out there that are alternatives just aren't as good a lot of the times. It's the truth. And the and it's, it's just, it, it feels bad. Like, you know, you describe, like, say, for example, image. Image is really, really good. And I, I've been very happy with image. And it has a lot of the features that Google Photos has. And, you know, I, I like being able to self-host it. But then they come out and, and say very recently, because they got, they got acquired, right? And now they're going to start charging for image. And yes, they say everyone who, if you're using it already, it's going to be an indefinite free trial or whatever they wanted to call it. Like that, that worries me quite a bit because eventually if you're calling something a trial, trials are always temporary because that's what trial actually fucking means. It's, it, it just completely turned me away from actually using it. So I basically stopped using image at this point because I know eventually I'm not going to be able to rely on it. Now, Google has the same problem because they're always closing things, but the primary services like Google Photos, you know that's always going to be there. Gmail, always going to be there. Google Search, they're trying their best to ruin it, but it's probably always going to be there in some form or fashion, right? So the, like the mainstays are going to be there and you can rely on those things. And when you're trying to find alternatives to, to the, you know, whatever you can find alternatives to, you have to suffer through, you know, sometimes, you know, they're not as good. But also, even if you find something that does work as well as you want it to, is it always going to be there? Is it going to continue to get maintained because, you know, maybe the developer decides to go and get hired by Google and therefore is no longer actually going to put effort into the project? Or maybe they, uh, you know, continue to update it and they start charging for it or, you know, do whatever it is that makes it unusable for you. And the, the problem with finding alternatives that aren't as, you know, I don't want to use the word stable, but stable is kind of the word that I'm looking for is like it's not, not as, you know, well entrenched as Google is. It, it makes it really hard because you have it, like if you let's just say you, for example with Gmail you wanted to move away from Gmail and you 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 decide you're going to move all of your stuff away and you choose an email pro pro provider that's alternative to Google 
you know, that's all good. Maybe it works for five or six years and then they, they get bought by, you know, random company X and all of a sudden it's no longer either as good, it's no longer as free as it once was, or maybe it's way more expensive or whatever it is. And you have to, and then you all of a sudden you're, you're either going to have to put up with that inferiority that, that cropped up or you're going to have to move again and you you select another one and you maybe you have to move again and, and the the thing that google offers is that you know it at least for the the, the main products they're going to be there now yeah they cancel the smaller ones but people have realized that the smaller ones aren't as stable so they don't rely on it as much so i i, I think that there's so when we ask this question there are so many different you know things that kind of go into it there's the you know the, the, the lack of good alternatives. And then there, if there are alternatives, you have to put up with that idea that, you know, are those things as, you know, stable as I need them to be in order to rely on them? And it's just so incredibly hard if you want to do this. So the, the, I think the answer for me is like, just no, you can't. Like if you're going to use online services at all, chances are you probably have to use Google in some form or fashion. Well, and the choices that you might switch to are also a product of an env- like so we we were kind of groomed by te- uh, groom might be the wrong word but we were our behavior and usage of especially media as as we've gotten to this day and age our online lives have gotten much more media dense and data dense so like much more pictures much more video content all of that stuff if you have to store all that stuff, and I mean, think about it too. Like our phone site, like storage size hasn't increased all that much over the past 10 years. Like the average phone, especially like if we're not talking about flagships, what? The the, the space has gone up to like 128 gigs from like 32, 64. Like that's not that much, especially when people are taking... 10 times more videos than they were before. So you, like we have like usage for these technologies that can't really like you have to use a company that subsidizes the actual cost by harvesting your data cuz there's I mean who most people don't go out and and buy the amount of storage they need to host all their stuff locally. Like even getting past setting that up, that may be difficult, but even if we made it super easy, no one wants to go and do that. I mean, people already don't want to pay two ninety nine to like increase their like, you know, storage like twenty X uh through a hosted service like Google or whoever. Like they don't even want to do that. So the idea of spending hundred and forty dollars getting one hard drive to upgrade their local storage is insane. So nor, nor can they actually have... even most people can't do it. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the part. I mean, that's the part, you know, we as nerds basically, <laughs> basically are like, to well, we're going to try it. We're going to try to make it work and we're going to spend hours and hours researching and tinkering and all the, and there's a, we're in that 3%, you know, we're in that 3% category. That's like, okay, yeah, we will, we'll give it a shot. But that 97%, man, they're, they're locked in. There's yeah. just no way. So, yeah, I mean, that's... And I can't blame them either. Like, because the entire, the entire way that we've gotten most people's, like, media consumption and the way they use technology has entirely been developed in a time where most of that stuff was free. So the idea of paying for it seems like a ripoff. But you, were, you should have never been able to build up that type of lifestyle w- without paying for it. Like it's it's kind of a like a gotcha. Here's the thing. Here's the, I, Drew, when you're talking about we're part of the three percent, like we're all in trouble because when we die, our loved ones are going to have to take over this technology burden of maintaining this stuff. <laughs> I have the option. Here's the thing, Matt. You're way ahead of it because you are in that documentation. <laughs> you're you're in that documentation like mindset right now, and I really thought to myself, my wife and I are sitting at the table uh, for breakfast a few weeks ago or something like that. She's like, if something happened to you, I would be in a world of shit because I don't know where anything is. I don't know how anything works. And I'm like, you know, I really need to take an opportunity. And like, I mean, it's going to take page. I mean, like a ton of time in documenting stuff, but 
I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm just, I don't think there's another option here. Uh, and I mean, this has nothing to do really with the main topic, but just no, write true. your, write your passwords down in a physical place where they don't, like a password yep. manager is great, but at least the main passwords and then instructions, how to get to the password manager or something just, just in case. But uh, that just popped in my head. It's like, you're right, Drew. We're the we're the the nerds are going are all out there creating this awesome infrastructure of really cool toys, and then they're they're allowing their family members to rely on them because it's a good idea. Because like you can you, even if it's just for backups or whatever, you know, it, it it allows you to have some control over that stuff. But the problem is like once the nerds go away, that that family is kind of probably screwed. So it just got me thinking like, oh goodness. Yeah, how many people are doing self hosting? Seriously, how how like what percentage of people are actually doing their own so small very few yeah, very, very, small. very few yeah so j- j- just a uh, i that was just a brain thing for, for there for a second so let's tra- let, let's then move into from if you if you know is it possible and, and we've all kind of agreed like in some in some ways but not really but let's just say that it was possible and let's talk about ways uh, that you can de Google yourself, but also in ways that you can't. What are the ways that you could look for to, you know, kind of as Tyler talked about earlier, obfuscate, put something between yourself and Google? Because there are a lot of ways to do that. So, and this just kind of brings me to the reason why I wanted to talk about this because I started self hosting Cirques. Now, for those of you who don't know, Cirques is a search engine. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but as someone talked about, like, like I use Zipper on my dis- on my distro, and it is slow, so I'm used to slow things. So uh, I-, I started hosting this thing, and it has been a phenomenal experience. Like, it's been so good, because I-, I am so fed up with Google Search because it has gotten so bad. Like, it's just, like, at this point, DuckDuckGo is actually better when it comes to search, which is just the stupidest thing in the world, because DuckDuckGo has always been bad. But Google search is bad, so I wanted to find something that if I'm going to put up with something that's, you know, not as good as it used to be, I might as well self-host this thing and have it, you know, thing. But Cirque itself is an obfuscation because it uses, it, it doesn't do its own indexing. It uses results from Google, from Bing, from DuckDuckGo, and all these other services, right? So what I, the reason why I want to talk about this is, that, like, because I, I, I know – that I can't de-Google myself. Like, I use Google Docs for work. I, I've talked to the guy who owns the website that I work for and, and asked him, could we please, I'm begging you, use something other than Google Docs. And he was like, no. <laughs> like, like absolutely not. Like, no, it's just not, not going to be, they pay for a corporate, you know, email for us all and we all, well, Google Workspaces or whatever they're calling it these days. Oh my God, R- yes. Right? And, and yes. we all have that thing and we're all in Google Docs all the time. Like I'm, I, I stare at a Google doc probably 10 hours a day. That's what I do basically for a living. So there's no way I'm getting out of Google. Like even if I were to quit YouTubing and, and be able to get rid of YouTube, I'd have to get a different job or something like, cause, cause this is not going to happen. So for me personally, there's going to be some things where I have to use it, but I, I thought, can I take at least some of the things? Cause, cause using if you can use less of Google, I think that that's a good thing. Even if you can't completely re- remove it from yourself, using less is good. I think that, that that's something that's true, right? So let's talk a little bit about that, those uh, things that you can do to remove yourself from Google. So, Drew, I know you've taken some steps along this road. Why don't you take us uh, off on this topic? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is I wanted to get rid of Gmail. And yes, I still have a Gmail account, you know, it's bec- but I, I had a Google workspace account that I used for my personal stuff. You know, let's just say just a guy, Linux.com. I had all those emails at Google. Well, no, I didn't want that any longer. So I switched that to proton mail and, and with that, I'm actually was so impressed with it. I started actually uh, buying the service and increasing its functionality, basically. So, yeah, I switched from Google Mail to Proton Mail. I, I, and I switched from Google Calendar to Proton Calendar and Google Drive to Proton Drive. And I have 
500 gigabytes of space in the current subscription that I have with ProtonMail, which is fine because that also incorporates images. So if I take a photo with my phone, it is backed up to my Proton drive rather than, and I stopped synchronizing my Google photos with my phone altogether so that it just goes to Proton drive and image for that matter, Matt, you know, it also goes to image at the same time. So I have two locations for it just in case, but the Proton, sorry, the Proton drive with images fine up until this point, you know, it's not got, it doesn't have the type of search functionality or AI that either image nor, you know, or Google photos has, but it's fine. If I go look at the photos, I can go and say, yep, that's the one I want. You know? I mean, that's really all you want out of the system is a backup. You yeah, know? pretty you much. keep the photos around. Yeah. So the other part of the, the equation is self-hosting NextCloud. That's the other part of the equation because I wanted something. And yeah, I want to use, I can use Proton Drive for that, but I kind of have come up with the idea that if I wanted something that was more pro, sorry, uh, Google Drive related, that automatically syncs to the cloud, NextCloud was a better use case than Proton Drive, especially in with the technology today. So, having Proton Drive, sorry, I keep saying that NextCloud for files, just as a file manager, is really good and in, and i keep adding additional stuff i saw your video matt on on next cloud a couple days ago and it was like yep yeah i was just like yep yep and i was just agreeing with everything because you can use it for notes you can use it for anything that you can th you could use it for mail if you really wanted to and calendaring and contact lists and passwords and so on you can self-host next cloud and replace a lot of the functionality or a lot of the services rather that Google has. Now where you where you I run into problems is I'm on an Android phone. That's a problem. You know, I use voice assistant like you Matt. I don't <laughs> I watch I could probably watch Tyler, you know, text somebody using two thumbs and go da -da 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 -da, and then I you know, I actually have to like talk my text messages and have it convert to text and then send because I suck so bad at using like a phone keyboard. And I also have in my house, all of those Google home, like little pucks basically that say, Hey Google, turn off the lights. Hey Google, do this or we'll ask a question. And that has been the more challenging thing to get rid of because I was so entrenched in using all of this Google stuff, including my my thermostats in my house are Nest thermostats, and so they are they're a Google product too. I think I'm I'm talking too much at this point, but no, it's fine. no, no, yeah. No. Like I, I, I don't think have, I think everyone's had that before. You know, I don't have an alternative for Google Maps. You know, even though there are things like OpenStreetMap, which is an open source solution out there. I don't have really a, I mean, I don't use Chrome anymore, but here's the thing. If you, and I saw this on the, in the chat too. If you're using YouTube and you're logged in and you ask, or you just search for one thing to watch, it will, in, it will just litter your feed with the exact same category so much that it becomes almost unusable. I watched one political thing in my YouTube channel, uh, on my YouTube, as I was logged in, and now I just can't get away from it. It's just insane. So that's my goal is to like, how do I get away from this crap? Because it's just infuriating to me. Well, I wanted to ask before we go too far, do you know if there is any way of getting an alternative like for those nests where it is not like connecting to Google? Like, cause I know there's like the home, like open source home, like, you know, implementations. Home assistant. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Like, that's I mean, does source. that work with the NIS? You know what? I have tried about five minutes to do that. And I, so I don't know the answer to that at all, but yeah, I'm, I would look at that. I also looked at another kind of like device called a homie, which is an open source product. I don't know. Do you guys, are you familiar with homie at all? Yeah. It's, it's like, so let's say you wanted to replace a, uh, Samsung, um, it's like a network interface, but basically it controls a lot, a hub, basically it's a hub that is open source. And so I have the need for a hub because my Samsung one is crap in the bed. So I just thought, you know what, let me try that. It's open source. I may be able to replace a lot of the Google home stuff if I can use homey in, in its, in its place. So I'm curious if that is something that can work. I see like mid mid range reviews. It's like, okay, three stars out of five. Well, I, I wonder if the people that are like using that are not like geeky like us, you know, or it's like, oh, I can't get this to friggin' work out of the box. So forget it. It's a one star review, you know? I don't know. I I wouldn't be surprised if the setup for that kind of stuff is difficult. Like, you know, a, a lot of self hosted or like self implemented wireless setups can be very difficult and i i would hope that the open source company or you know the more open implementation they put just as much work into making it convenient and accessible but that's kind of like it's the same thing with like linux phones i don't i don't exactly see them doing that right because most of the people who are you know doing that type of stuff are more well kind of similar to us they're more like developers they're more interested in tinkering around with stuff so they want they want to make sure the user has every single option they can a librem 5 is a great example of that they have kill switches for every single thing inside of that phone so like there's it's a much even though somebody doesn't have to be necessarily a nerd or a tech dude to use it there's a lot of things about that phone that it doesn't make sense for an average person to go out and spend the money unless they know what they're doing. Also, Linux Mobile is sh- shit. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's, it's just so bad. But like, like as an alternative to Android, Drew, there's things like Lineage OS and and Graphene. I was OS thinking about so Graphene. Like- yeah, I was thinking about Graphene OS as something that could be used. So yeah, I, I'm already I'm. I'm on top of that. Yeah, I sure. hear I hear good things about them, but I, I also know I, I'm also a little leery of them because you have to root your phone, and that means that you're going to have some problems with some banking applications. And I use my banking application all the time, you know, and, and you, you know I I don't want to have to deal with that. And also I use the Google Assistant thing, and the Assistant thing is 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 weird, right? Because those things don't make money for Google or Amazon. Like you read all the time that they're always they're like they're always losing money and whatever. And and one of my biggest fears actually is for them to get rid of Alexa because my parents use an Alexa box to change the TV channel. Now that's just a recent thing. We used to use the Google Assistant and that stopped working. <laughs> and so we had to go to the, the the Fire TV Cube and that works really well. It actually works better to control YouTube TV than the Google thing did, which is just the fucking biggest irony ever. But I worry because these things don't make money that eventually that's going to go away. And then how am I going to get them to be able to change the channel? Because my cable company doesn't offer cable anymore. It's the, yeah. it's the stupidest thing that's ever, right? You, you have very to use, common. Yeah, you have to use YouTube TV. It's like it's the only one that they really integrate integrate with. And yeah, there are other options, but my parents are, you know, they're well into their 80s and they can't see the TV. No matter how, even if we got a bigger TV, they wouldn't be able to see it. It's just changing the channel when there aren't channel numbers to go to anymore it is really hard. So th- that's what they use. And we've seen, like, I'm going to call it Alfred, but I know that's not the name of it. Like there was, there was a, a voice assistant that was open source for a while that they worked on for quite, quite a few years. It was not called Alfred. It was something like this. I think it started with an M. But anyways, they had this thing and 
they just couldn't get it off the ground. First of all, they just have the resources to do it because it requires a ton of resources for the to, to actually work. And eventually, it, it either got acquired by someone or it just got abandoned. And I don't know where it was. I'm sure some somebody's in the chat trying to say something. A anyways, the uh, the thing about this, the assistance is just I, I don't think that there is enough there there for for them for an open source one to ever really exist. But on the alternative, like, did you guys know that Firefox has this gigantic database of voices? Or well, not Firefox, but Mozilla does. Basically, they have this whole service where you can go there and you can train, like, like their tool to recognize voices. And it, you can upload your voice and all this stuff. And there's a whole bunch of, um, like, you, you just say a word and then it has a whole gigantic database of a whole bunch of people saying this word. And... Anyone can tie into that database of voices. I don't remember what it's called, so don't ask me, but it's been around for a few years now. And the idea would be that someone could create an assistant and you can use that database of trained information uh, to make it better. It has happened. Was it Mycroft that you were talking about? That's uh, it, Mycroft. Yeah. It's like why? Sherlock Holmes' brother is Mycroft. I was trying to remember. Right. Yeah. I don't know why I thought Alfred names aren't very good. Anyways, the the... Uh, the assistant thing is very interesting. The an another thing, just for the obf obfuscation thing, is we talk about YouTube. There are ways to do it. Now, this is going to get me demonetized because <laughs> because we're not supposed to talk about this because it's a hundred percent against TOS. But there are let's call them tools. I'm not going to name any of the tools, but there are tools out there on mobile and on the desktop that you can use that are basically front ends for YouTube. And it obfusc I, know it's, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> right. It allows you to obfuscate. You're still using YouTube, but they're putting a basically a barrier between you and actually using the site. Right. And there's there's a ton of tools out there. You want to know what they are. You can go Google them yourself. <laughs> you can go Google. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, maybe use Bing. I don't know if you're that worried about it. But the, the thing is, like, you, you can do this. The question I have for you guys, though, do you think it's a reasonable solution to do that? Like to use the, fuck it, I'm just going to say it, new pipe or things like Invidious or whatever to use those uh, no. things? No, no. Uh, and, and here's why. As much as people will say that watching YouTube is just about watching the video, no, it's not. When you see a comment and you want to respond, it is genuinely worth making an account. I think everyone has seen one comment on a video and been like, if I didn't have an account, I'd make an account just to respond to you. You know, <laughs> like everyone's had that experience. So I don't know if those are viable. Alt like I would be, I, I would be more interested in part, like me personally, I'd be more interested in using something like Rumble or Odyssey and, than just trying to obfuscate my usage of YouTube because at the end of the day, like, I can watch a video, but a large aspect of YouTube is the community discussion around the video. And if you if you can't participate in that at all, I mean, sure, you can, I mean, you could do that to watch YouTube. But, I mean, there's a reason why people don't, like, as much as YouTube, since we've already, you know, gotten this thing demonetized, as much as YouTube goes after the downloader stuff, like, it's not really all that common. Like, I mean, for for someone's regular digestion of YouTube content. Like it's that's not what they use it for at all. So I like I don't I don't know if you can just you can just separate the YouTube video content from the platform itself and be fine with that. I mean, sure, we get there I think there are platforms that let you create faux accounts that are not actually linked to the account that you're using. And then comment from those, but I mean, at that point, your comments will probably get removed just because they're. Seen That's a good spam. point, though, Tyler. Because I, I thought to myself, yeah, you know, if you want to be part of the community or whatever, you want to comment that that would be one thing. But what I thought Matt was going to say was, if you use an RSS feed and are watching YouTube, and and basically you say, like, okay, I can choose whatever all of my subscription YouTubers out there. And I can just put their RSS feed in my fresh RSS and I can watch their videos on my RSS feed. 
and never have to <laughs> and never have to type that domain that domain name into the browser and go there or look at it on my phone as an app the youtube app if that would be a way to get around doing that if, i thought that's what you're going to say matt i thought you were going to say you I, okay so i thought about it but it's that three percent thing again. Like RSS is so nerdy. Fair enough. And it's not easy to set up. You have to get into the the whatever and get the code out in order to put those things in there. And it's the same thing. Like like yeah, you, technically you can do it with like if you wanted to get rid of Reddit, you can do it an RSS of Reddit feeds, right? But then you, I mean, some of the fun of Reddit is the comments. Like the comments section of Reddit is like the the the, the most fun part because there are a bunch of crazy fuckers there and you want to see the, the drama that's part of the thing right so i i, I get what you're saying T tyler but the the question that i have well not it's not a question it, it's an observation i don't think that we can discount the importance of the youtube algorithm because that thing is very addictive right like sure if you're very disciplined and all you've ever used youtube for is to follow a couple creators or you only ever go there to get how-to videos on you know how to create kitchen cabinets or whatever you know if that's all you ever do on youtube you're gonna be fine you're never you don't need the youtube algorithm but the norm what, what i think the normal usage of youtube is is that you go there to the home page and you say oh what is youtube recommending me today and all of a sudden you, you, this is what i did the other day when i was supposed to be working uh i came across a video for whatever reason i have no clues of these gigantic excavators of them just it was like three hours long of them just picking up dirt and putting it in in, in dump trucks that's all they did there wasn't music it was just just that I watched the whole three hours, I swear to God. And now, on my YouTube feed, that's basically what I have is a whole bunch of excavators. And, and, and you know, I had my fill. I had, I had my three hours. I don't need any more. But, yep. but, the, but the, that's kind of the YouTube. Because that is, you do get that sense, like, if you, if you go there, you watch something, it's going to give you something else. And that kind of feeds in. Like, it's um it's, it's a... It, it, it they they say it's an addiction, right? It's just like, oh, that's the next thing. That's really cool looking. You know, that, that looks very interesting. I'm gonna go watch that, and then you go watch that, and all of a sudden you've spent eight hours on YouTube uh, when you should have been doing something different. And 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 Tyler, you made a point earlier where you didn't want to call this grooming, uh, and, and I understand there's there are a lot of negative connotations with that word, but it's absolutely what they're doing. Right. And, like, and it's not and it's across the board. There's a reason why they basically said, hey, schools will pay you money to take Chrome OS. Right. We'll not only give you the devices, but we'll pay for the management of them. We'll give you everything for free as much as possible. And we'll probably pay you money to do it. Right. Because what they want to do is is instead of having kids use Windows as they grow up, they want them to use Chrome OS to grow up. Because when, if you use Chrome OS during high school, chances are the first computer you're going to buy probably is going to be a Chrome OS device, right? And you, they, they get you early, and that's literally grooming. That's literally what that is. And they do it on YouTube, too. Like, like you, if you hand your kid like who was maybe like five or six an ipad or you know a, a chrome OS or whatever like some kind of device and they get on youtube and yeah they have youtube kids or whatever you get on there and you know they're just watching this thing all day long and it's just as addictive for them as it is for us i mean there's there's i mean their grains are less developed than ours and we can't not be addicted to youtube how are we expecting them to do it and, and you know um, well, I don't even know that it's just like a purely our side addiction thing. Cause like it is it, YouTube, like it is very well known. They're very open about it. Their best interest is to keep you using the platform. So not only does the algorithm try to give you good recommendations based off of your usage, it's smart enough to learn from your own behavior. So like you were saying you loaded up those ex excavator videos, you watched one, now all you get is excavators. When you leave the website and you stop using YouTube, YouTube now knows that if it shows you too if it pigeonholes you too much, you'll leave. So like it it adapts and gets better. And like there's a good middle ground to hit between random BS and pigeonhole. The bad aspect of YouTube is because it's constantly balancing the two, it's really hard to compete because they have so much user data. Like they've learned, like the algorithm has learned from so many people. I mean, how are you going to come up with a, 
a competitive alternative. Because, I mean, if you go to Rumble Odyssey, it doesn't matter how long you've used that platform, you're getting random bullcrap all the time. Yeah, the front page of Odyssey is like, what is this trash? Exactly. Like, like, You're like, the, how? like this. Like, sometimes it makes you feel like I just haven't used it often enough for their algorithm or whatever it is to actually know what I want to watch. But also, I mean, there's there's also an aspect on Odyssey that there's just not stuff there that I want to watch, right? Yeah, some of the big YouTubers are on there, like Muda's over there, uh, Mental Outlaws over there, DT Brody, all those guys, right? A lot of those are the guy, the the videos that I like to watch. But I don't watch them over there. I watch them on YouTube, right? And, and Having um, so I, I want to get back to the to the obfuscation thing here in a minute, but just let's talk about Odyssey a, a, for for a second because there was a lot of hope in the open source community when th that first came out because a lot of the, the background and technology is open source and there was a and some of it was because it was crypto and everybody was like yeah crypto's the next big thing boy did that turn out to be stupid um you know well i don't know if you remember but when they were first starting out there was a time period where one of the biggest selling things or selling points for odyssey was there was no moderation i don't know Whose idea it was to make that a selling point? Yeah, that was there's horrible. still more no moderation. So if you're watching this on on Odyssey, I see your comments. I see them. You should be ashamed of yourself. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not all of you, but you, it, 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 if, there's it, some. If you, we got, know. if you got offended by me saying that just now, you're the reason why I said it. Okay, <laughs> so all right, but the, the problem with Odyssey. My biggest problem with Odyssey as a content creator isn't that there's not a lot of people over there. That doesn't bother me. Like I, I knew going in the the, the library, the library, uh, the the cryptocurrency that was fucking nonsense. I was never going to make a dime off from that. I knew that going in. It, I didn't go over there because I expected to become the next Bitcoin dude, you know, on, on that platform. I just knew that. I was using it as a basically as a backup to YouTube and that's what I continue that's the reason why I'm still there despite the moderation stuff despite the fact that you have both left wing and right wing nut jobs all over the fucking place over there like it's like the only place on the internet where left wing and right wing they co coexist peacefully over there it's really well, weird and, and they both hate everyone equally yeah the, like uh, inside of their own group and isn't the that other. just the way to be though Tyler I mean <laughs> I mean heck just just one good equally. way to live that's, fucking, that's the American way <laughs> we're <on> America. <laughs> also, another thing is I can't trust a platform that can't tell me how it's going to make money. You know, especially yes. when something like that is going to require a ton of resources along the way for them to continue did to be. See, did you get the email about them? They're no, no longer doing, doing ads. ads. Like, and did you see this? So, so you brought this up. So I have to ask you this. I read that email, and in a section in that email where Odyssey says they're no longer doing ads, they say they are confident in their monetary methods or whatever. Do you know what those are? So they have a premium subscription service that you can pay for. It's like $10 a month. It's called Odyssey Plus. I thought about actually giving them $10 a month. I thought about it for about all 30 seconds. I clicked on it, and then I realized that they don't accept outside payment. You have to give them your credit card information. I was like fuck off there's no ch i would rather hand my credit card and social security number to a nigerian prince than give it to <laughs> odyssey i'm just saying like I, I like i have no trust in that them at all to maintain security of that information right like why can't you just accept paypal they would have had ten dollars a month from me because because for me like i said i don't use it because there are people over there watching like i'm, I'm glad for everyone over there who watches them you guys are all most you most of you are awesome but for the most part because it has youtube synchronization and there's no storage limit whatsoever all of my stuff gets put over there that way if my content does get pulled off from youtube or you know whatever i have some form of backup i have something that i can go for and, and you know i can download that that video again if i have to or you know i can just move over there and have like you know, you know a smaller audience but at least i have some form of a backup such as it is but you can't look at something like that and think like, you know, oh, that's going to take on YouTube. The same thing like Vimeo or, uh, you know, Daily Video or whatever the hell they're called or, you know, you know, all of these things that are like really small, you know, they have their fans. But the only thing I found on all of those platforms is, is that they are as much as we consider YouTube to be a bubble. 
those are like much more concentrated bubbles of information, yes. right? A- yes. a- and you you don't have the the exposure to more people because they're just not more people. They're like And because they are considered alternatives to YouTube, chances are the vast majority of the people who are over there are people who won't or can't use YouTube for various reasons, right? And again, very much a generalization. Not everyone. I mean, there are a lot of people on Odyssey who use it because it's not YouTube, and that that's a perfectly thing. But you get all you guys on on Odyssey can't deny that there are some people over there that are using Odyssey because they can no longer be trolls yes. on YouTube. Yes. You know. And, well, and I mean, th- that's kind of Odyssey's rumbles. Like, all of these platforms' biggest problem is, like, even though, like, you could use them as an alternative to YouTube, if, you're, if your hope in using them is that they will actually be one day a strong competitor to YouTube, the only way that happens is if Google takes YouTube out back and shoots it in the back of the head. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, you need, YouTube would have to be heavily kneecapped for these platforms to be able to expand to where YouTube is and also compete. Because I don't know how else you do it. There are there have been rumors in the past for like a, a very, actually very long time that YouTube was going to make it much harder for smaller creators to post on, on their platform, right? If you had like a less than five or 6,000 subscribers, they just were going to make it very hard for you to succeed. Now, they haven't done that, but there have been rumors of it for a very long time. That's how you kill YouTube and, and how you enable other platforms because then those smaller creators then go over and decide they're going to use something like Odyssey or like Rumble or whatever. And that's how the, that's how how the death of YouTube would happen if, if they started getting too big for their britches and only relying on the Mr. Beasts and PewDiePies of the world uh, to make their content. Because one of the things that makes YouTube so good is like if you need – Drew, let's just say you were going to remodel your bathroom and you don't know anything about remodeling your bathroom, but you want to do it yourself. You want to learn some stuff, right? Where are you going to go? Well, you can either go down to the local community college and learn or YouTube and that's where you go. And, and – you could come up with something that's more niche than that. Say you wanted to learn how to, I don't know, host Nextcloud. You know, where are you going to go? You're going to go learn it on YouTube, chances are, right? That's going to be one of the first places you go. And one of the, the best things about YouTube uh, is that there's all of this breadth of content. You don't get that unless there's the Linux cast and, you know, uh, just a guy Linux and Zany on there making content, despite the fact that hardly, and relatively hardly anyone watches us, right? And compared to, like, the beast you know mr beast nobody watches us but we're just as important i think to the platform's success as mr beast because without us you you don't have you know that breadth of content where people can come to the the platform and do the thing now uh all that was a a very interesting you know side tangent i think it was very important to have but i, I want to go back just a little bit to the obfuscation thing because you're right in the whole community th- part tyler but i i also think that there's a we i talked earlier about stability and those things just aren't stable because they're youtube is always constantly trying to kill them so it's really hard to rely on something like that that you can't like even the rss stuff drew that stuff has always worked but eventually less and less though you know yeah yeah like uh, eventually they're gonna say like yeah we don't want to provide an rss feed for every channel like like what's i mean already you have to basically be a hacker in order to find the code in order to do it right they're making it harder and harder eventually they're just going to get rid of it altogether and then what you're going to do i mean you're gonna have to go find something different so if you're using that for a you know a way to obfuscate your usage of youtube you know, that's good. I think that that's great. I mean, as someone who makes money on YouTube, I, sometimes I get people like, oh, I feel guilty that I don't actually watch your content on YouTube. It doesn't bother me. Like, I, like yeah, I, I make a few hundred dollars a month on YouTube rev- ad revenue, but I, I don't use YouTube for my living, so it doesn't bother me if you don't watch my content here, right? Uh, 
but I also I, I'm also uh, as someone who would be interested in using something other than YouTube, you know, every once in a while at least to lower my usage. I know that I can't go through and do that uh, and be any reliant on those services because eventually they're going to think like even like YouTube DLP or whatever recently went through a thing where it just was just broken. Like half the time you couldn't use it because YouTube changed something in the back end and it just busted. Now I think they fixed it since then, but it's like a it, it's very it's very much like pirate piracy like those piracy sites go down all the time and it's like whack-a-mole right it's, it's just happened i'm so totally getting demonetized but th at this point it doesn't it doesn't matter uh, I, they probably would just demonetize me for the title um anyway probably um <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so there are outside i mean we talked spent a lot of time talking about youtube because it's the hardest one to get away from yeah, but there are other things that you know, like, like you talked about Proton Mail and Proton Drive and stuff like that. And there are, and Nextcloud is just like such a big one because it does a, it does so much of what Google does. I, I think that, and I didn't really talk about this in, in the in the video that I made, but the the biggest hurdle for like Nextcloud is that you have to do it yourself for the most part, right? It, I think that Nextcloud would be so much more popular if there were, like, if you could go to Linode or whatever and just buy a Nextcloud server. Like, it's already set up for you. Uh, you just have to type in your domain. It does all the DNS stuff in the background. It would be great. Like, I, I don't know if the, no, the nodes is the best company to, for, to do that, but that was just an example, right? Like, if you just go to an X company and say, I want to buy a Linode, like, yes, those things do exist, but they're they're out there. Like, they're very, very rare. Something more mainstream that just hosts Nextcloud for you, I think would be awesome because you wouldn't have to have the burden of, you know, ho hosting it yourself, worrying about storage. You know, if you're doing it on home lab, you don't have to worry about opening up ports or setting up tail scale or any of that stuff, right? And because because you have to host it yourself, that limits it to nerds, right? It's not a service that you can just sign up for. You have to know how to set it up. And that just doesn't, like you said earlier, it just doesn't apply to a lot of people. Now, even, you know, even back when you are, I'm, I'm going to liken it to people that are using like WordPress for their hosting. They, they need a website and they have a WordPress hosting company and they can easily like change their content by just logging into the WordPress site and, you know, adding a, adding an about page, adding a, adding a bunch of stuff, a contact page and so on and so forth. Those are, that's kind of like what you're talking about, like having that kind of service, but not everybody uses even WordPress. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't, but I'm just saying the easiest thing for people to build a website like that is to use something like WordPress. But I mean, that's kind of getting away from this, but I do want to go kind of a little bit, go back to the free stuff that Google will lock you in on. Cause I, it, it was in my head for the last like 10 minutes, basically it was about, there's two things that they offer for free that a lot of people take advantage of. Google for nonprofits and Google for education. And so they are appealing to these, these, comp these groups of people that are trying to do good things and whether it be education or nonprofits, and then they're locking them in to a free service, not because they, not because of the, you know, the goodness in their heart, but because they can then <laughs> They can leverage that information later. I'm just, I'm just putting that out there that that is another like tool that they use to bring you into their, you know, into their ego, e ecosphere, whatever it's called. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, to be fair, it's not just Google trying to do it. Like Apple attempts to do it with like the iPad or whatever. And Microsoft obviously has been doing it for generations, you know, uh, because, you know, given and, and stuff. And it's gotten way worse now because like now every kid has some kind of technological device given out to them by the school or they have to have some kind of device uh, for school. Like when we were in school, we had computer labs, you know what I mean? It, you know, or books. <laughs> you know, 
or books, like actual books that you had to like. I, I don't know what these books things you are. You are so old. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but yeah, but you, you know what I mean? Like like we we didn't have like laptops when I was in like middle school or whatever. Yeah, they existed, but they were the size of a truck. You know, they were huge. And by the time I got to college, even then, they were still really big. Like I had my first laptop was a 17-inch Sony Vio, cost an amazing amount of money. It was like half of my tuition, um, and that thing could have killed someone if you hit him with it. It was huge. Um, it, these days they're really small. They're really, I mean, and because everyone has to have them, you know. Google makes these deals or whatever, and you can get them for like 200 bucks in the school, you know, oftentimes gets them for free. So anyway, anyway, so like, yeah, the, the education stuff is, I think, I think that it, it's an under appreciated method for them to get their hooks into a lot of people. And it, it, it's not only the hardware, it's not like just Chrome OS, like, because people can easily leave Chrome OS, but they're going, they're going to sign up at that point for a Gmail account. Like you're going to get a Gmail account probably in like middle school at this point, maybe even earlier. I don't even know. I remember I don't have kids, but like sometime during your school experience, you're going to get a Gmail account because you're probably going to have a, G a Chrome OS device. And that means that you're going to have all of your email from a very young age tied to Gmail. And like we talked about earlier, once you have a history in Gmail, it's really hard to take that stuff and move somewhere else. Um, it's possible, but it requires effort and it requires an interest in doing so. And I think that that's kind of where we should probably stop this conversation and, and just kind of go around. And, and because the thing is, is that we talked about this all as if leaving Google behind is something that a lot of people want to do. And like I said earlier, I think that some people, a growing number of people do want to leave Google behind, but the vast majority of people think Google's fucking awesome. Like they, they, they get a lot of free, I mean, people love free shit. You know what I mean? Like, like, like it's the, the, it's the free box at the garage sale. It's the most important part of the garage sale. Cause that's what gets people in there and they're going to go there and grab as much of the free stuff as possible. Right. And that's what Google is. It's the, it's the free box at the garage sale. And you, you get your free stuff in your head. Like you have somehow earned it. And what, and once you have that, you know, you know, reliance on something that is free it's very hard to then have any interest whatsoever in leaving it behind because it's free and a lot of the alternatives that we've talked about here tonight are either not free in terms of the service or aren't free in terms of having hardware to host them right like you have to put some some monetary resources and having something to host next cloud of some kind or, or whatever right and I think that that's the number, I mean, we, we've come up with probably a dozen reasons why it's really hard to do this, but really the number one reason is that the vast majority of people have no interest in doing it whatsoever. No, that's fair. That is most of the difficulty. Yeah. That, that's totally fair because like we said before, I think we're in the, we're in a vast minority of people that can try to de-Google. Otherwise you're SOL, baby. You know, that's just a fact. We, um, we, we, I sent you guys a link about the, you know, the, the, uh, the case that, uh, that ruled this week that, you know, Google, you know, was a monopoly and everything. There have been these cases in tech for a really long time. I remember, well, one thing I, I think I should be clear about is Mike, the company that I work for actually has a business relationship with Google directly, <laughs> not you know, not in the sense that shell, shell. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. I, I know that we make money doing, you know, doing what we do with Google. However, I also used to work for a company that was directly with Microsoft, you know, and, and I remember talking to people about it at Microsoft and they said, yeah, we need to make sure <laughs> that we don't lose this next court case you know they bought something called i don't know if you guys remember this or even like it's called something called visio and oh, it yeah. was a flow charting software and they made it part of office yeah and right. they they but there was two parts to that um it was a company that they bought called intellicad 
And IntelliCAD had two main software initiatives. And one was called Visio, which was for flowcharting. And the other one was called IntelliCAD. And that was a CAD, a, a, a pure drafting utility. And they were like, we don't want any part of this IntelliCAD. Here you go. We're going to put it at this open source uh, consortium. And here it's free. And the reason why was because they didn't want the court case, that they didn't want AutoCAD to come to them and say, monopoly, and then, and then tie them up in courts for the next four years. You know, that, that, was, that was something that they just could not handle. So they said, nope, it's open source. And I'm wondering at some point if Google ever decides, you know what, this is not worth our, this is not worth it anymore. And then they try to offload some of this stuff into an open source world. That would be interesting to me because I don't know that that would ever happen, but it has happened in the past is my point. One of their arguments in that court My optimistic case. side likes that and thinks that's a possibility. My realistic or kind of down, downtrodden side says Google's going to do what Google does and just kill it. Yeah, no, and that's what their history has been. Their history has been yeah, we don't see long-term potential here. You guys have about 12 months and then we're going to pull the plug yeah, on this exactly. thing. Exactly. And you we're know? moving all of you around. Hopefully you'll be able to keep your jobs. We'll move you maybe we'll move you around to a different part of a different company or whatever, but like yeah, Google this One. Did. I don't know if you guys remember Google One yes. or you know, yeah. so there was all kinds of stuff that they've just decided, you know, it's not worth our time. We don't need to be in this space any longer. Google killed the stream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro. Uh, no, I think I think we're back now. Uh, Google, OBS yeah, I hit refresh. And I think we're good. <laughs> uh, OBS try, tried to reach connect several times, so I think it's going to be okay now. I don't know if I'm having internet problems or if Google actually decided to do things uh, about, about the monopoly thing. I, I'd be very so. What was it? Twenty years ago or so, Microsoft got sued because of the Internet Explorer thing, and. Today, Microsoft is the biggest corporation in the world. You know, they get like $3 trillion market cap. They were perfectly fine despite losing that case. Now, did they go through a period where they weren't the biggest browser anymore? Yeah. Like Internet Explorer, that court case you could argue led to the prevalence of Chrome today, right? If they had won that case, Internet Explorer would be the premier browser to this day. Like that would just be absolutely the truth. But my point here is that it didn't scare Microsoft away from browsers forever, right? They have Edge now and Edge is slowly creeping up on being a competitive browser to Chrome in terms of market share because when you install Windows, you can't get rid of the fucker. It's there. You might as well use it, right? Like you can't, you can't uninstall it. You can't easily make sure that it, like you can get rid of it for a little while, but then it's going to come back in an update. So uh, they're do they're, they didn't learn their lesson when it came to to the the whole monopoly thing back then because they're back doing the same things now in terms of google it's probably going to be the same thing right like they they let's just say they come out and say you you have to you have to sell the search division or uh you have to sell the ad division or whatever that you know whatever the solution they're going to come up with i don't know i don't see you know it changing uh the outcome really all that much as much as you as much you as much as you think that having more competitors and you know separate smaller companies would make a difference i don't know that it would maybe i'm just a cynic i don't know you know what though thank goodness for google if you are if you work for mozilla you know because without them without google search they don't have the funds they just don't you know they're they're at three percent of the market share and they would be in a world of hurt if they did not have that kind of $500 million <laughs> annually that, that Google seems to be pumping into Mozilla. They could not operate otherwise. So there's a big part of me, like, and I know you're right, Drew, but there's a small part of me that thinks that they'd be better off without the money. Because Tyler and I have talked about this on on podcast before, where M Mozilla is the worst manager of that money in the history of the world. They spend that money on the stupidest shit. They ha have like seven thousand employees. 
Like, it's a huge company for a browser company. Like, what? What? I'm not sure what 7,000 people do working on one product. Like, yeah, they have other products, but nobody knows what they are. Like, I talked about that voice thing earlier. Couldn't name the name if someone paid me a million dollars. Have no clue, right? Firefox is the product, right? And the fact that they have 7,000 pe- people working on it and their CEO, at least at one point, was earning like three or four or five million dollars a year. Maybe it was more than that. Maybe it was less. I don't know. It was some extraordinary amount of money um, for a company that, that makes no money on their own uh, or very little money on their own, right? It, it, it's, o- it, it's always phenomenal to me. So some small part of me thinks that if they did, if they had to suffer on their own, maybe that would have spurred them to not lose the market share that they did and, and continue to be as good at being a good browser at, at one point. Are you saying that there's a bunch of open source uh, initiatives out there that are badly managed? Because that just is shocking to me. <laughs> <laughs> that right. is shocking. Well, I mean, like Mozilla is probably the best example of it, though, because you can take one look at their exec, how much their executives are paid, and immediately you're like, okay, I see what's happening here. Like, and that, and, and to me, like, I think that's the 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 biggest problem with a lot of these competitors that are more open. If they lack the absolute necessity in all areas of innovating or doing something that is hyper competitive, they just won't do it. And I mean, Mozilla is the prime example of that. They have no incentive to do anything new. And yet, for some reason, they try to do new things, but in literally no way at all that any consumer that uses their products wants them to. Well, and no original ideas. Right. Like no original ideas. Every new idea that they have is basically just a reaction to what's cool at the moment. So AI, crypto, Mastodon, you name VPNs. it. Right. Yeah, VPN. Like all this stuff is basically just a rehash of what other people have already done. And, and you know, Mozilla is the company that you want to cheer for like you like you all three of us so open much. source nerds like so we, we want we all three of us if we had enough money would happily donate to make mozilla you know good like 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 if we'd we'd put if we were developers we'd want to volunteer for them we'd we, we'd want everything in our hearts to for this to be the company and foundation and product that does succeed right we we, we want it so big badly that we can taste it but they fuck it up constantly like 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 I, I, we've talked about this so many times but the, the, the fact that they can take this money from google and then not take advantage of it like google's handing you money put that towards making the absolute best products you possibly can while also being financially uh, responsible with that money so that when the money does go away you have a awesome nest egg that you can live on for 10 years while you're trying to figure out an actual monetary stream that's going to support you going into the future. But they're like, no, nah, man, we're just going to give our CEO and CTO millions of dollars and bonuses and stuff like that. It's it's like a, a not-for-profit who, instead of taking the money and doing what they say they're going to do it, just pays their executives tons and tons of money. Yeah. Um, well, it, like the, a great example of it is if, if you've seen like in games, like when you go on your phone, you know all of those like cheap games that are like clearly knockoffs of really popular ones? It's like Mozilla pumps out those kind of products and services to make it seem like they're being productive and doing something when you can play in games reality on your phone? I didn't even know that. <laughs> well, what I mean, well, no, what the shit? <laughs> but you, no, no, no. Tyler's exactly right. You would not be surprised. You would not be at all surprised if M- Mozilla announced tomorrow that they're going to create a, a a version of Candy Crush to put on the mobile device, right? Like they would call it something, you know, weird. Like it's going to be an open source version of Candy Crush or whatever. Like if, if that's what the, if they thought that that could give them just the tiniest bit of of money, even if it was never going to actually work. You could see them doing it. And that's like, like Mozilla would be the company to market that game for uh, under privacy. And one of the big aspects of the privacy is, is they block and censor messages all the time in chat. 
And also, this game, like, Mozilla has a talent for not building out features that are convenient under the guise of privacy and security. Like, I don't know if you've noticed that, but there's like a lot of services where they're just, there's not functionality there. And you know there's private secure, like, implementations of it, but Mozilla just doesn't do it at all and brags about how secure and private it is. I feel like I've, I've I feel like I've steered us to, off the cliff here a little bit, but I did want to say that, you know, what they've done in the mobile space is irrelevant at this point. I mean, they, they bought, was well, not bought, but they're using, or they decided to incorporate canine mail and make it like a, uh, sorry, a Thunderbird mm -hmm. product or uh, whatever. mobile type thing. Yeah. Not yet. I mean, it's not ready for prime time anytime, you know, anytime soon. It's just not there yet, you know, and they need to, and they need to have some way to do Microsoft Exchange. They have to get that accomplished. Have to. Well, supposedly it's coming. Like, but we've heard it before yeah. that it was coming, right? No, no. Like I said, supposedly in the next major version or whatever coming out in the next year, Exchange is finally going to happen. But the thing is, if like, you got seven thousand employees, Matt. How can you not have that shit done yet? And it's I mean, been it's twenty years. You know, like Exchange isn't like a new thing. It's been around since I was in high school. You know, it, it's the and for a mail client that is something that you're marketing as an alternative to Outlook, the fact that it doesn't support the thing that Outlook does is like not supporting mail at all. You know what I mean? Like it's the, it's the stupidest thing ever. But yeah, we are completely left thing. But there was just one, one last thing on Mozilla, just because I have to say it, is I use Vivaldi as my browser. I get a lot of shit for using Vivaldi because it's not open source. And I al and also because Vivaldi has a stupid ass stance on open source where, oh, we're 95% open source. That makes us cool. No. Uh, if you're not all the way open source, you're not open source at all. Um, that's the way that I, at least when it comes to browsers, that's the way that I look at it. At least don't, it's not something to brag about if you're 95% open source. That's the way that I look at it. But the reason why I use Vivaldi is because they've taken Chrome, which I hate, but they've done cool things with it, right? Like, yeah, yeah, the, the email and the, the, the RSS feed reader or whatever, I understand. We don't want an office suite in our browser. I don't use it. But things like tab stacks, things like uh, workspaces and stuff like that, uh, they and they're constantly coming out with new features that are really cool. Like a, like a year ago, they came out with Session Manager, which basically means you can save the entire session as a file. And if you want to later on go back to it, like it's, it's basically like ButterFS for your browser. Really cool, right? Firefox, what are you doing? Like like. I cannot name you one feature that Firefox has put in Firefox in the last five years that has made any impact on the browser whatsoever. None. Hey, man, they made tabs bigger. Okay. <laughs> and they, they, that's, right. right. Like, and they, they've done a couple of redesigns that make it look different, right? That's, you know, whatever. But it's something. Like, here, here's the thing is, like, we know it's possible. There's a, there's a browser called Florp. It's a stupid fucking name. But they've gone through and, and they've basically made Firefox be cool and like hire the florp guys like they're doing it like they're making firefox cool why can't you do it you have seven thousand employees you have 500 million dollars coming in every year or two years or whatever it is like this, this and if a dumbass like me can see it surely there's someone in the corporation that'll think like you know what maybe and i just maybe we do something with this money to make firefox cool again you know, like like a, a new feature. It doesn't even have to be an original feature. Like just copy Vivaldi, like at, at the beginning, like and, and use that as a springing off board for actually having some creativity. Because what people, not everyone, like like most people would still would use Chrome, but there's a good portion of people that if Firefox came out with a really cool feature, would say, you want know it's time for me to use Firefox, Firefox to try again because it has this cool feature, and. We all know privacy is not sexy enough. It's so that you can you can be the most private private browser in the world. It's not a sexy feature that's going to draw on people. Uh, so you have to have something that is user facing that is cool if you want to draw people back in. And Firefox just ain't doing it. Like it's it's dumb. Okay, we really, we've been going for an hour and forty minutes. 
<laughs> yeah, I could go another hour on the topic. Actually, bro. I know, I know. <laughs> I think we, we all could. Maybe we should do an entire. We we have done in the past entire uh, episodes on Mozilla, but it's always fun to bitch at them because because like I said. It's the company that we want to succeed, but they are always fucking things up. But anyways. Even Google. We could go another <laughs> I know. Google, I know. Yeah, we didn't, yeah. It feels like we didn't even talk about Google at all. We spent all of the time on Mozilla. <laughs> uh, it's not true. We talked about Google for a whole hour, and it was good. Anyways, but before we jump out of here, we do have to jump into the nuggies of the week. And to be honest with you, I don't remember what mine is, so I'm going to la- go last. So, Tyler, what is your nuggie of the week? I've been using IWD for my networking. Uh, it's... Kind of like network manager, but more simplified. And I've just, for some reason, stopped using network manager and been using IWD, and it's been fine. It's very simple to use. It's good for wireless networking. Like, it's fine. So, I mean, it's not like it doesn't bring up like a GUI interface or like, you know, an in-curses interface like network manager does when you're in the terminal, but it's got a very simple to use, like, drop in like shell that you run for it so like i haven't had any problems using it it's been very nice and yeah i've just been fiddling around with it cool uh drew your nuggy of the week my nuggy <coughs> excuse me my nuggy of the week is a next cloud app and it's called configurable share links okay so when you use next cloud and you want to share a file, for example, outside of your, outside of Nextcloud, you can do that with configurable share links. Plus with that app, you can like have multiple shares. Let's just say you want to share with one person, you can set that up. If you want to set up a public share, you can also set that up. So the configurable share links is kind of has granular control where you are you can customize each one you can even set a number of downloads or an expiration time for that shared uh, that shared link but you can like i said you can have multiple share links for one individual file and then set it up any way you want to it's really really good i found a couple good use cases for it you can even set up like an expiration for it or a password protection for the file, it's it's got some good features to it. So it's called configurable share links, and it's a Nextcloud app. One of these days, Drew's going to do me a big favor and start making a YouTube series on Nextcloud because he finds all these really cool things, and I would like YouTube videos about them. <laughs> that's, that's that's Matt's request. All right. Uh, so my mine is Calibre Web. Now I've talked about Kavita in the past. And how it was good enough for ebook hosting, but not great because it wanted to have everything as a series. It really bugged me that that was the way that it did it. But I had problems with Calibre Web because it does require you to use Calibre. Now, I got sick of Kavita and decided I was just going to start using the desktop client of Calibre for my ebooks. Once I did that, I decided I was going to set up Calibre Web, and it is miles, like, it is a hundred miles ahead of Kavita when it comes to ebooks. It is so astonishingly good. Now, yes, it does require you to have a Calibre library, but you're going to want one because it's the easiest way to upload books to your web, and it's just, you can edit all of your metadata there. You can easily send it to Kindle, no matter whether you're using the desktop client or the web interface. You can go through and uh, add things to series. You can upload new books if you want to enable that on the website. You can do so. There's just a ton of stuff that you can do. And the best part about it is that you don't have to have everything as a series. Things can be standalones because, believe it or not, there are some authors out there that still just write standalone novels. Uh, Not everything is part of a series. So that is... it's phenomenal and the ui is just it's just so much better like it's just astonishingly how how much it's better and uh it is a little slower um but i think that's just that's just on my case because i do have my calibre library in a uh, nfs share and it does require every time it connects to it using autofs so i'm assuming that there's some connectivity stuff that's causing it to slow down a little bit but other than that 
it's fantastic. And if you're going to self-host an ebook platform, Calibre Web is the one that you want to go with. Uh, Kavita is just not as good. Now, I'm sure for manga and comics and stuff, Kavita is going to be better, I, I think. But for ebooks, Calibre Web miles and way better. It's so good. I wish I'd done it way sooner. Like I, I suffered through Kavita for months, or you know, what feels like months. And uh, this is way better. Okay, so that is it for the Linux cast. This was an epic podcast. I I'm very, very happy that we had such a fantastic conversation because I'm a little weary of this conversation simply because I knew for sure going in that uh, we were going to get in some Google trouble because they don't like you talking. <laughs> they don't like you talking about them. I almost guarantee that the comments get shut off on the the, the final video. Almost, almost because promoting anything like a, a, a YT downloader uh, will is considered basically promoting terrorism that's what they tell you it's oh nice okay. really weird uh, yeah. uh, totally. so if, if you're watching this and the comments are off just know that i didn't do it that's a youtube thing hopefully we'll get past it because there, there's a lot of content here that they'll have to scrub so maybe they won't be able to turn off comments for a little while anyways uh that's it for linux cast if you want to watch us live you can do so there's a whole bunch of people watching us now we've had over 600 people watch uh so far so if you want to be one of those people, you can watch us live every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We were a little bit late, but we're always a little bit late because none of us can tell time. That's just the way that it is. Anyways, you can do so by going to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash linuxcast. You don't have to have a Google account to do it, but you do if you want to be in the live chat. So that's just the way that it's going to be, unfortunately. So uh, if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so in any number of ways. Probably the best way is to contact us via email. That's email at the linuxcast.org is the email address. Uh, I do get your emails and I do read them. I don't always reply because uh, I do get quite a few of them. So if I don't reply right away or I don't reply at all, just know that I read it, but I may not have replied. I try to get to everyone. And if you do, if you do send one to me that needs to go to Drew or to Tyler, I can uh, forward those on because I have email addresses for those uh, folks as well. So you can email me or us there. You can head on over to the website, which is the linuxcast.org. Now, just a small thing on the, the, the website, my update script to update the website is completely broken. And I thought it was an open SUSE problem, but I did. I went and installed Eleventy, which is the blog platform that I use on Debian, and it's also broken over there, so I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, so there haven't been updates on the YouTube or on the website for a while, but you can go over there to the linuxcast.org slash contact to get all of the contact information. But anyways, if you want to get in contact with us, there's, you can go there. You can go to Drew's YouTube channel. He's Just a Guy Linux on YouTube, so youtube.com slash Just a Guy Linux. There he posts awesome content for Debian and self-hosting and scripts and window managers and all sorts of stuff. You can head over there, check him out. Tyler, he, is, he has a YouTube channel too. <laughs> Sometimes it, use it. He doesn't Sometimes. use it. He doesn't know the password. Okay, I, I, I'm convinced that every once in a while he'll he'll, he'll see the password. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the funny thing is it only works for him. It has it has to be a, a Mac thing. <laughs> Anyways, youtube.com slash ZanyoG. You can head on over there. He does have a, a long history of posting to YouTube. It's just an on and off thing for him. He's he's not he has other VR related things to do. That's just the way it is. Anyways, uh, head on over there. Subscribe to these two fellas. Their channels are awesome, such as they are. So uh, that's it for this one. We will see you next time. If you want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash LinuxCast. I forgot about that. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon. You guys are awesome. And we're getting out of here. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye -bye.